record. Here we go. So now we're looking at properties of gases. So we just talked about the fact that the gases um, diffuse through their containers, they mix in all proportions, they expand to fill their containers. So gases do not have constant um, volumes. They don't have a definite volume. Gases will take the volume of their container. So you can squeeze all the gas that's in the room, you could squeeze all that into a two liter bottle if you like, and the particles will just get very close together and the pressure will get very, very high. So gases take whatever volume their container has. Um, as I just mentioned, they're also very, very compressible. Gases can be compressed. They can also expand. They're compressible and they're expandable. That is not the case for liquids and solids. They have very low compressibility. So these properties, these physical properties, are explained using kinetic molecular theory. KMT. This is one of the most important ideas in the unit. It's a foundational idea that we'll refer back to throughout the unit. So kinetic molecular theory, and like Dalton's atomic theory, it has several postulates that we're going to look at here. Okay, so kinetic molecular theory explains the properties of gases. There's the motivating air balloon. All right, so the postulates of kinetic theory. Um, summarize them, put, your, put them in your own words if you like, um, but make sure you understand all five of these. And again, ask questions if something's not clear. So number one, gases are composed of large numbers of particles, and these are in constant random motion. Now, just like Dalton's theory, some of these postulates may be completely true, they may be partly true, partly false, or maybe they're completely false in the real world. Okay, so the kinetic theory is trying to create a simple picture of gases in order to understand their, their behavior. So this first postulate, do you think this is a true thing or is this partly true or do you think this just isn't true at all? Gases are made of large numbers of particles, constant random motion. Okay, I would hope that you would agree that that is a true statement, okay? That first statement is completely true, okay? The gases are made of atoms in the cases of something like helium gas, or they're made of molecules in the case of something like hydrogen gas or methane gas. If they're mixtures of gases, they're made of molecules and atoms perhaps, and those particles are constantly flying around the container, constantly bumping into each other randomly. Now, someone just asked, would I post this uh, PowerPoint online? I will be posting the PowerPoint on Edmodo. Uh, number two, gas particles are separated by large distances, relatively speaking. Okay, on an absolute scale, no, the distances are, are infinitesimal. But relatively, compared to the size of the particles themselves, are gas particles separated by large distances? The theory says, on average, approximately, that's what that little squiggle means, 10 diameters. So what that's saying is, on average, if you had a hydrogen molecule in the gas phase, the nearest neighboring hydrogen molecule would be about 10 diameters away from that. Now, of course, that estimate it will vary dramatically, right? Because gases can expand or they can, or they can be compressed, but there are large distances between them. That statement, true, false, partly true, that, that, that's true. That is, that is, I don't think there's anything wrong with that statement. Number three, gas particles collide elastically now make sure you underline that word and we're gonna define it because it's a really important word. Gas particles collide elastically with each other and with the walls of their container. That word elastically is, is what's the last little bit of this bullet. There's no loss of energy in the collision. That's what elastic collision means. No loss of energy during the collision. Think about something that you've probably seen before, maybe in the, in the gym class. You take a basketball, hold it out in front of you, let go, and the basketball falls and bounces off the floor. When the, bounce, when the basketball bounces off the floor, you know from experience it never reaches the starting point, 
right? So you drop the ball, it bounces up to a height less than where it began. And as it keeps bouncing, it bounces up to a smaller and smaller height and eventually stops bouncing. So why is the ball not bouncing back to its original height? It's because in the real world, the ball hits the floor and gets deformed slightly. There's also air friction along the way. So during that collision with the floor and falling through the air, the, there is energy lost. So during collisions if, of real things, there's always some energy lost. So there is no such thing in the real world as an elastic collision. There's always energy lost. But in kinetic theory, we make the assumption that when gas particles flying around randomly, when they collide with each other, or if they collide with the wall of a container, there's no energy lost at all. Okay, so that statement, clearly from what I've just said, must be completely false, right? Because gas particles, there's nothing in the real world that collides elastically. Now the question would be, how much energy is lost during a collision between gas particles. If it's just a tiny amount of energy that's lost, unlike the basketball colliding with the floor, then perhaps this assumption, even though it's wrong, maybe it doesn't introduce too much error. And that's, that's the, the point. It, it actually doesn't introduce a huge amount of error under most situations. So it's a useful postulate of kinetic theory. The fourth postulate, the gas particles are assumed to be points in space. So we assume that each particle, each molecule or each atom has no volume. The atom or the molecule is considered to have a negligible volume. Think about that for a moment. Suppose I asked you what's the volume of our classroom at school? What's the volume of the room? You might approximate that it's a cube or that it's a rectangular solid. You could measure with a ruler its length, its width, its height. You could calculate its volume. But would that actually give you the volume of free space in the room? If you just took length times width times height, you'd have the volume of the, the rectangular solid. But is that how much volume is available in the room for people or things to move around in? The answer is no, because there's furniture in the room. The furniture takes up space. On a typical day, there's also people in the room. The, the people take up space. So what if we removed all the furniture, all the tables, all the chairs, all the benches? What if we removed all the people as well? Okay, so now we have a completely empty, in quotation marks, room. Would length times width times height then give us the amount of space available in the room to move around? The answer is no, because although we took out everything we could see, the people, the chairs, the tables, the benches, there's still air in the room. And the air is made up of molecules and atoms. And there's space in between those particles, but those particles, they actually, although they're tiny, they contain some volume. Right? Every molecule has a diameter and therefore has a volume. Every atom has a diameter and therefore a volume. So what kinetic theory says is, let's pretend that each of those molecules and atoms has zero volume. Then we can assume length times width times height of the room actually does give us the volume of available space in the, in the room. Okay? Now, if those particles are far apart and tiny, then that assumption would introduce a, only a tiny source of error. But if there are lots and lots of particles and they're now really close together, then that assumption would actually lead to a pretty large source of error. So kinetic, kinetic theory, you can see in these postulates three and four, there are some error that's, that's being introduced. And the error can be, can be infinitesimal under some situations, or the error can be larger in other situations. The last one, gas particles experience no intermolecular forces, IMFs. That's going to be a hugely important topic in our next unit on liquids and solids, intermolecular forces. What that refers to is, imagine two people past each other. They just walked past each other, but they didn't touch. Right? It's social distancing. If they passed each other without touching, maybe they ran by or walked by each other, 
you would say there's there's no interaction between them, right? They they in no way interacted with each other, and that's what this is. That, that's what this postulate is saying. When gas particles fly past each other without colliding, because of course if they collide, there would be an intermolecular force. But if they just fly past fly past each other in the container, then this postulate says there's no force of attraction, there's no force of repulsion between the particles. There's no intermolecular forces. Now, is that true? Well, for people, yeah. Right? If two people pass each other without touching, there's, there's no force between them. But particles, molecules, and atoms, they often have positive and negatively charged parts to them. And so if a positively charged part of a molecule flying past another molecule with its positively charged part, then those two positively charged parts would repel each other. Even though the particles didn't collide, they would repel each other because of those, the repulsion of the two positively charged parts of the molecule. So in fact, molecules and atoms do experience repulsive forces and also attractive forces. If a positive and a negatively charged part of two different molecules came close together, that would be an attractive force, an intermolecular attractive force. Now, kinetic theory says the gas particles are so far apart and they're flying so fast that we can ignore those intermolecular forces. They're not important, okay? Now, I hope you can see of these five postulates, the first two were pretty much bang on, they're good. But the last three are problematic. They each introduce a small source of error in, in kinetic theory. So keep that in mind. Real gases do not behave like this. So therefore, here's an important idea. A gas which obeys all five of these postulates, number one, it doesn't exist in the real world because Gases do have volume. The particles have volume. Gas particles never collide elastically, and they do experience some intermolecular forces. So there's no such th there's no gas which actually behaves like this. So what we'll say is, if we had, if we think of a gas, if we imagine a gas that behaves according to these five postulates, then that gas we'll refer to as an ideal gas. An ideal gas is an imaginary gas which obeys kinetic theory perfectly. Real gases deviate from kinetic theory. They deviate in some ways, okay? And we'll talk about that more later. All right, I'm assuming there's no questions. Nobody's asking anything. Can someone just say hi, just so I know you're actually there and listening? Hi. That's hi. Not hi. 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 Let me, let me say, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Okay, let, let, let me know. Let me know, please, if I'm going too fast or too slow. Because I I can't see you interacting, so I don't know whether or not I'm spending much too long. I'm trying to get people a chance to write as well. Okay. Evan, open my text. Here we go. <laughs> so, pressure. Okay, this is our first mathematical idea. Pressure is defined as force acting over an area. Okay, that's its definition. And so that leads to a small formula. Okay, um, so a small mathematical formula, pressure equals force divided by area. Now you might want to include some units in that equation. The SI unit for force for those of you in the physics class, you might know this. Force is measured in units called newtons, named after Sir Isaac Newton. The capital letter N is used for force. The SI unit for area is the square meter, meter squared. So therefore, the SI unit for pressure would be technically newtons per square meter. Okay. So Newton per square meter would be the SI unit for pressure. However, nobody wants to say Newtons per square meter. So instead of using the term Newton per square meter, we usually use a derived term called the Pascal. P-A-S-C-A-L um, is, the, is the same thing as a Newton per square meter. So the SI unit for pressure is the Pascal. 
Uh, now somebody's just walked into the room and I doesn't realize I'm going to be teaching for another 25 minutes or so. What do you need? Uh, notes. The package? Yeah. It's right behind you there. Okay. Or, yes. Enjoy. All right. So every time a gas particle, molecule, or atom collides with the wall of the container, that little collision creates a small force acting over a tiny area where the particle hit the wall of the container. So therefore, every collision between a particle and the wall of the container creates a tiny amount of pressure in the container. But if you imagine the huge a number of particles that are colliding repeatedly with the walls of their container every second, those, those little pressures add up to a measurable pressure um, that we can measure in the lab. So the sum of all those forces over, over the area of the container's walls creates measurable pressure within the, within the container. So pressure is a really important idea. The barometer, the can you go back, please? I can, but uh, make, it, make it quick. Oh, wait. I think I can go back. There we go. Just since, since I've gone back, let me just uh, talk about something briefly that I usually do in class. Um, let's do a thought experiment here, shall we? Um, we're going to get, um, we're gonna get uh, Nathaniel to lie down on the floor for us. So we're all imagining Nathaniel is lying on the floor, okay? Okay. All right, and now he's lying on his stomach, okay? Now we then get somebody, oh, let's say Evan, Evan Rees. Evan, Evan is gonna walk on Nathaniel's back, okay? We're all picking hey. that. Now that might be a little bit uncomfortable, but some people actually like that, right? As it helps, my back was sore, would you walk on my, that actually is something some people do, it's like a massage kind of thing. But it would be a little bit awkward, a little bit painful, okay? Now imagine that instead of just walking on Nathaniel's back with his bare feet, suppose Evan decided to, you know, it's like Friday night, and he's getting dressed up, and so Evan puts on his high heels, okay? And then Evan walks on Nathaniel's back wearing his high heels. How would that experience be for Nathaniel? Very bad. Very bad. And, and Evan wearing, wearing a dress? Well, I'll leave that up I to you. I got my stilettos on. Okay. I'll leave that up to you. But, Evan's wearing a dress. Serious question. Why, why is it, it's the same person. It's, it's Evan walking on Nathaniel. But why is it so much worse when he's wearing some like high heels than it because, was wearing bare feet? Because there's, a, the lot, there's a lot more force going into a smaller area. Yeah. No, smaller. Nathaniel, what you said. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Nathaniel, what you just said was, not quite right. So you said there's a lot more force. There's the oh, same. The same. Stop, 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 stop. Right. There's the same force because it's, it's Evan's mass. Evan's weight is actually the force um, that, that we're talking about here. But because he's wearing those heels, his weight, his force, is now <laughs> acting on a much smaller area. area. And when you look at that formula, force divided by area, if the area gets much smaller, the pressure will get much greater. Higher. So his Higher. force did not increase, but his area that the force acted on decreased. And that creates so much pressure, you can actually injure the person, right? Now, a, a famous little thing you've, everybody's heard of is the, the person nails. who lies on a bed of nails, right? And, and it looks like magic. Is it magic? He's lying on a bed of nails. Is this uh, Indian? Uh, what's what do you what do you call them? Swami or whatever it is. He's lying on a bed of nails, but his his force, his weight, is now spread out over hundreds and hundreds of nails, isn't it? So how much pressure is on every one of those nails? Very very little, right? So it's actually Not looks, a lot. It looks dangerous. What would be much more impressive is if you were to lie down on one. one. <laughs> exactly. Lie down on Go one. Nail. <laughs> then I'll be impressed. Okay. So when you lie down on one nail, the tiny area of that one nail would create so much pressure. Of course, you'd be in pain. That's like the balloon thing with the nails. What? The balloon thing. It doesn't really what? Wait, the, the balloon <laughs> sure if you, is actually the, the, the same thing. Balloons, no matter okay. what. Okay. <laughs> let me let me give you one more 
Let me give you a cup or bed of your nose. It's not likely Liel, to pop, Liel, but Liel. it's got one name. Liel? Liel, be quiet. Let me give you a couple more examples that, that we should be familiar with in, in Manitoba. So you, we, have, uh, we, have, we have lots of winter in Manitoba. There are animals like a snowshoe hare, right? Or a lynx, Canadian lynx, a cat. Yeah. They live in the winter time and they have to trudge through a lot of snow. What have, how have they evolved to, to do that? They have really, really, really big feet, right? So a snowshoe hare has yeah. huge feet. And a, and a lynx, if you've ever seen a lynx, the paws on the lynx are huge. So why, why does that help them? Why is that an adaptation in terms of evolution? Their huge area of their feet create less. They can walk on snow. They can walk across the snow. In the same way we wear snowshoes, right? To walk across the snow. And one last example in the same kind of vein, if someone is in the springtime walking on a river or lake or ice, and it's thin, you can fall through the ice. Um, so suppose someone has fallen through the ice and someone's going to go try rescuing them. How should the rescuer approach the person who's fallen through the ice? They're they should not, be lying down. And why does that help? So they lie down and then sort of inch your way towards them. What does the lying they, down do? They because distribute there's more like, areas spread out in your <laughs> same way. So it's like, I've, it's like I've been walking on my back. It'd be this, right. you're more spread out. That's right. So you're looking at that formula again and thinking it mathematically by spreading your area out with the same weight, you create much less pressure on the ice, right? And it's a safer way to get across. So make sure you understand this, this very simple idea and understand it mathematically how it works, pressure, okay? All right, let's, let's move on. So the mercury barometer, this is a device which no longer looks like this, so, but I want you to sketch something like this in your notes, please. So it was invented by an Italian named Torricelli. That name will be important, okay? So barometer was measured by Torricelli, and it was used to measure atmospheric pressure or air pressure, if you like. We've all heard of air pressure but probably most of us don't even think about it. In the same way that a fish living at the bottom of the ocean doesn't even think about the pressure that it's, that, that's, that's, uh, that it's living under, but if we imagined going to the bottom of the ocean, we'd realize we'd be crushed by the weight of the water above us. We are at the bottom of an ocean of air, and that ocean of air, we are like the fish at the bottom of the ocean. We don't experience it because the pressure inside us is the same as the pressure outside of us. So we don't actually feel the air pressure. But air pressure is huge, as we'll see in just a moment. So what Mr. Torricelli did was he took a, a big, long tube. This tube, let's, let's say it's about a meter long. Okay, It's about a 1,000 millimeters long. Then he filled it with liquid mercury, okay? Today, mercury barometers are rare because of the hazards of dealing with mercury. He took that mercury, can you imagine doing this? Filled the tube completely with mercury, so there's no air at all in that tube. He then covered the mouth of the tube with his thumb or his finger, maybe he stoppered it. He turned the tube upside down and put it in a dish that was full of liquid mercury. Okay, then he took away his thumb or he took away the stopper. Can you imagine what I just said? A one meter long tube full of mercury, turned upside down in a dish full of mercury. Well, when he let go of his finger, the mercury in the tube fell. So the level of mercury fell down. And as you can see in the picture, it fell down until it was about 760 millimeters high. 760 millimeters of mercury was in that tube. Now, what was above the mercury in the tube? Well, originally it was full of mercury. So some people think there's air above the mercury. There is no air, okay? The air did not get in the tube. So above the liquid mercury is essentially a vacuum. A vacuum is where there's no air at all. Now, it's not a perfect vacuum because the mercury is liquid. There'd be a tiny, tiny bit of mercury vapor above the liquid mercury in that tube, okay? Now, if you look at the picture closely, 
you'll notice on the left side of the tube, there's a gray arrow pointing down. That gray arrow pointing down represents the weight of the mercury or the pressure caused by the weight of the mercury in the tube. Then on the right-hand side of the tube, there's a blue arrow pointing down. That blue arrow is the pressure from the air. Again, we don't think about this, but above us is a huge amount of air from the atmosphere, and the weight of that air is pressing down on us all the time. It's also pressing down on the dish, the mercury in that dish. So you have mercury in the tube trying to, to come out, but you have air pressure pushing the mercury back up into the tube from the outside. When the tube was full of mercury initially, the, there was too much mercury for the air to hold it up. So, so eventually the mercury, started, the mercury started to fall out of the tube. Whoops. But eventually the mercury stopped falling out of the tube. And when it stopped falling out of the tube, stopped draining out of the tube, it was 760 millimeters high. That means the air pressure was able to support 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay? Let me know if that makes sense to you. The air pressure is, pull, is supporting the weight of 760 millimeters of mercury, okay? Now, what would happen if the air pressure outside, because it's not constant, the air pressure changes from day to day, it also changes from place to place. If you go up on the top of a mountain, you're higher up in the atmosphere, so the air pressure would be lower. If you're deep, deep, deep in a canyon, you are now below sea level, so the air pressure would be higher. So what happens when the air pressure <coughs> increases? What would happen to the level of mercury in the tube if the air pressure increased? Wouldn't there be less volume of mercury because the pressure can support less weight? So, so if the air pressure pushing down on the mercury in the dish, if that air pressure increased, so we'll, uh, Wouldn't it push the mercury up the tube? Yes. Yes. So, yeah. the so the level of mercury would go up if the air pressure went up. If the air pressure fell, so if there was less air pressure, then with less air pressure, it would be able to support less mercury, and the mercury would fall in the tube, wouldn't it? So what? So what? Torricelli invented here is a simple device. He put a scale on the outside. With a simple device, he could detect changes in air pressure. When that mercury level goes up inside the tube, it means air pressure is increasing. And if the mercury level falls down in the tube, it means the pressure is decreasing. Would this work with water? What's the answer to that? Would it work with water? The answer is yes, it would work with any liquid. But why would you use mercury instead of water? Well, for, yeah. for a couple of reasons. The main reason is that water is much yeah, more dense. Yeah, water is one gram per it's milliliter. Heavy. Mercury is, I forget exactly, 19 grams per milliliter, something like that. So if you used water, you might want to note this for yourself. If you used water instead of mercury, air, pressure, it is high, like air pressure could support... Um, 30 feet of water, 10 meters of water, okay? So by you, you'd need a tube 30 feet tall instead of, instead of a one meter long tube, okay? So that's the main reason. The other reason is that water is more volatile than, than mercury. The air, the, instead of a perfect vacuum above, you have a lot of water vapor above, and that would create another source of error in, in the barometer's readings, okay? All right, let's move on. So that's a barometer, it's used to measure air pressure. So here's a picture, you can, what I was saying earlier, we're at the bottom of an ocean of air. If you took one square meter, imagine that on the ground around you, one square meter. So a square that was one meter on each side. The atmosphere above that square meter has a mass of 10,000 kilograms if you're at sea level. So 10,000 kilograms is pressing down on every square meter of the Earth's surface. That 10,000 kilograms is the weight of the air above it. 
well, well, we're walking around here on the surface of Earth. Why aren't we crushed? As the answer, as you see at the bottom, it's because the pressure inside our bodies is the same as the pressure outside our bodies. Now, it says, recall the aluminum can demo. Um, I will show you a video of that in just a moment. We would normally do that in the lab. So the pressure can support 76 centimeters of mercury, 760 millimeters of mercury, or if you used water, about 30 feet of water. Okay, now you might want to note that's at sea level. Okay, if you were at sea level, that would be true. All right, why don't we take a little detour here. I'm going to switch from... Oops, I'm going to switch from uh, the PowerPoint to a mic to a YouTube video. Okay, so I think you guys can see this. There's a couple of them. Why don't we start with the boring one? So this is a this is a demonstration you've probably seen at some point. I've also I've done it myself before. So this is a teacher showing the aluminum can crushing demo. Okay, we'll watch it and then we'll explain what's happening. To show how strong the air pressure can be. The idea can you guys hear that at home? Yes. 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 All right, here we go. These cans yes. are all out of water and they're heating on the hot plate so that they're boiling. What we'll do is Okay, so there's a small the cans are empty, but she put a tiny bit of water in each can and put them on a hot plate. So the cans are now, the water inside the cans is boiling, okay? Keep that in mind. You can see that the cans are, the water's boiling, there's steam coming out the top of the, the cans, from the mouth of the cans. That's critical, okay? So there's water in the can, just a little bit, just a few milliliters, and as, it's, as it heats and boils, you can see the boiling, the steam coming out the top of the can. Flip the cans over into this bucket of cold water. The water is at freezing point. She said freezing point you don't need. You could use room temperature water also, but she, she might have some ice water there. Put them over. We're going to see what effect air pressure has on the can. Okay, so you saw the obvious, the most dramatic thing was the can crushed. So what happened? The idea is... But did you notice also water was coming out of the can afterwards also? That water coming out was not the water that was originally there. She only had a few milliliters of water in there at the beginning. There was water from that pail of water that, that went into the can during the, the crushing. While the can is on the hot plate, air is being pushed out, has higher pressure. But when it's flipped over... All right, so let's just stop there. You might want to, in your notes, point form, describe what's happening here. Okay? This, you might be asked about this later. So the first thing I would say, you want to put a little title, this is the crushed can demo, okay? So imagine the can was just an empty can, nothing in it at all. Does it actually have nothing in it? Hello? Air? No. That's the key. There's air. air. There's air in the can. So make a note of that. The empty can, initially, it's full of air. And what's, and what's the pressure inside the can? Well, it's an open can. So the pressure in the can would be the same as the pressure outside the can. It's the air pressure. Now, why did she put water in the can? So make a note of that in the second thing you should note. She puts a little bit of water in the can, three or four or five milliliters, and she starts to boil the water. So the water boiling turns from liquid water to water Vapor. vapor. And that water vapor, we saw it coming out of the top of the can. So if it's coming out of the top of the can, what did the water vapor do to the air that was in the can? It pushed the air out. Okay, so that's, make sure you note that. The boiling water created water vapor. And that water vapor is at a higher pressure than the air pressure. I know it's a higher pressure because it's coming out of the top of the can. And as it's coming out of the top of the can, it pushed the air out of the can. So what is the can full of at that point? Water vapor. That's the key. 
the can is full of water vapor and probably a little bit of air. It probably didn't push all the air out, but it's almost entirely full of water vapor, right? Now, what does she do next? She puts the can upside down so the mouth is in the cold water. What will that immediately do to the can? In the Crush it. Water? Well, first it lowers the temperature. Lowers the, the temperature. And if you lower the temperature, what would happen to the water vapor in the can? Condense. It condense. it condenses back to liquid. That means there's less gas in the can. So the pressure drops. And the pressure drops. And it drops quickly because the gas is cooled down quickly. The, va the vapor condenses quickly. So now what's true? If the gas inside the can, the water vapor, has condensed, the pressure in the can is now much smaller than it used to be. But the outside pressure is still what it always was. It's air pressure. So what happens now? The air pressure will crush the can, crush the can because the, the pressure in the can is no longer equal to the pressure outside. It gets crushed. Okay? So that dramatically demonstrates pressure air pressure. All right, let's 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 see a larger scale version of this, okay, much more dramatic. Okay, this, this, is, this is a train car that has been steam washed. So they- Is it gonna go boom boom? You can see the it hose. It goes the opposite of- It you says can, implode. You can see the hose, right, attached? That hose has been blowing steam, hot water vapor into the can, into the train car to clean it out. When they turn the steam off, you're supposed to simply leave it to cool down. If you just leave it to cool down, the water will condense inside and air will rush back inside to fill the space. But what if you don't, what if you turn off the, the, um, the steam and then you cap the can? You cap the train car so air can't get back inside. Then the pressure inside would drop. Pressure. And we'll see, we'll see if air... It'll pressure, drop as it cools, right? That's the idea, yes. But instead of cooling it in a, in a bucket of water, it right. will <clears> cool <throat> in the air. But remember, you had to close the valves so that air can't get back in. If air can get back in, then this would be very boring, right? So let's take a look. Oh! <laughs> it went boom boom. Whoa! <laughs> Daniel, it's reverse boom boom. Yeah, boom, it's an implosion. Right. <laughs> That's time pressure. Is that like the experiment last year with ammonia gas? Air pressure yeah. is very, very strong. <laughs> and that's what you want to keep in mind. 10,000 kilograms of air, right, above every square meter on the Earth's surface. So air pressure is huge, okay? All right, back to some boring standard units of pressure. Aww. Can you see this? Can you watch Food with Tedna? Nope. Yo, it's almost three. I'm still, I'm still seeing the train. <laughs> Are you still seeing the train car? Yeah. The train. All right, let me see if I can get rid of the train car. Owen, why are you a lion? All right. Don't oh. come at my boy, Owen. Owen's an amazing oh. lion. Can you guys hear me? Owen got shooters. No, we Yo, can't. Oh, Dan, what's good? Is what's my up, bro? Did Mr. Pennant leave? Kieran, we can't hear you. Hi, Hansu. I'm showing up when I talk. Thank you. All right, so here we go. Units of pressure. As I said earlier, the standard unit of pressure was the Newton per square meter, which we call the Pascal. But that's such a tiny amount of pressure that we usually use instead kilopascals. Okay, so kilopascal, of course, is a thousand pascals. Standard pressure, the pressure that we were just talking about that could hold up the mercury, is 101,325 pascals. Do we need to know that? You need to know this number, 101.3 kilopascals. Now that 101.3 kilopascals, there are other units that are, that are 
equivalent. Okay? So in the US, unfortunately, they don't like to use SI units a lot as we've seen in other situations. They prefer using a unit called the atmosphere, ATM, atmosphere. So 101.3 kilopascals is equal to 1.00, and you can see why they like that unit. It's a very nice number, 1.00 atmospheres. Now, Mr. Torricelli, with his barometer, he was using millimeters of mercury in that, sorry, he was using mercury in that barometer and measuring its height. So another unit is 760 millimeters of mercury. And of course, that's the same as 76.0 centimeters of mercury. And if you were in the US, you might even say inches of mercury. It doesn't matter. Who, who invented the barometer? This guy named? Tortellini. Torricelli. 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 Come on, Ethan. So the number, the, uh, those number guys, guys, the number 760 millimeters mercury is also referred to as 760 tor, named in honor of him. So there's no conversion, those are the same things. All right, why don't we just end today's lesson? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna not end it immediately. We're gonna end it with some, some pressure conversions. So make sure you have those numbers written down. 101.3 kPa is one atmosphere, is 760 millimeters. Wait, wait, wait. What, what are we waiting for? I'm trying to write this down or like screenshot it so I can keep, there you go. Okay, so let's share. I'm going to switch to my document camera. Can you go to slide six, please? Oh, wow. Why are you yelling? I'm going Sorry. To the doc not in class. Okay. All right, so now you can see the document camera in front of you, the worksheet. So let's just do some simple conversions and we'll call it a day, okay? So pressure, why am I seeing Evan on the screen? Yeah, I saw Evan for a bit too. All right, so pressure conversions. Is he here now? Just Did pin Mr. Patnode's video. How's that? How do I pin it? Not I'm still good. You see Ethan thing right I did. <laughs> I don't All right. see Mr. Patnard. Just find I Mr. Patnard in the... Smart Evan. I'm clicking the pin video and it's not doing anything. Just turn off your mic. How do you get Mr. Patnard back on? You don't. Now I see Dahlia. <laughs> I see Dan. I see, oh I see Leo. <laughs> Hi, Dahlia. Nate. I